All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Good evening. This is Brother Ron for Cross Connected. This is our segment of Victory in Jesus this evening. We're going to talk a little bit uh, out of Exodus chapters, the end of chapter 4, chapter 5, the beginning of chapter 6. We're talking about a little bit of a story there. And the title tonight is going to be just trust in the Almighty God and not in the power of man. We're going to see some things here tonight that pertains to even believers today, believers getting saved, saved, and then unbelief sets in at times. But instead of trusting in, in the strength and the power and the intellect of man and man's abilities, we need to be trusting in the Lord. The Lord God Almighty is what we need to be, who we need to be trusting in. But let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will speak through me tonight, Lord. I pray that you will have your way, that you will minister to each one of us, that you will make your word real to us, that you will touch us with your word and minister to us with your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So, Let's, you know, trust in the Almighty God, not in the power of man. I want to read, uh, I want to read two verses. I want to read Exodus 4.31, the last verse of Exodus chapter 4. And I want to read the first verse, Exodus chapter 5. And this is what it says. It says, And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. And afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now, God had visited Moses, had visited Aaron, uh, and they went and they told uh, the people of Israel. And at the end of chapter 4, the people of Israel are bowing their head and worship because God has spoken to, uh, he had visited his people. He had seen their affliction. He had made a promise to them. And they worshiped him. And they believed him. At that moment, they really did. They believed him. They were worshiping God, they were believing God, they were joyful. Now by the end of chapter 5, these same people who were worshiping, believing, and joyful, they are unbelieving and they're bitter. They're unbelieving and they're bitter by the end of one chapter. You go from the end of chapter 4 to the end of chapter 5. That's what you're going to see. Now listen. The good news of salvation is one thing that we see here. But the fight against the evil power that wars to keep the soul in bondage is quite another. The good news of salvation is one thing. But we got to understand, once one gets saved, the enemy will begin his attacks. Now, let's take that to those of us who the Lord has drawn back to the cross, do us back to an understanding of the gospel, if you will. For sanctification, for walking in victory daily with the Lord. When he gives us that, when we hear the message of the cross, we hear that gospel message and how we receive receive sanctification by grace through faith. How the Holy Spirit works by our faith being in Christ is what He's done at Calvary. The Holy Spirit makes that real to us. And there's and we know that it's real. We know that it's true. And, and we start living for the Lord or trying to live that way for the Lord. But what happens? The enemy begins to attack us. The war starts. We must then be... You know, really, for the Christian, the scriptures talk about it. The good fight of faith truly begins. Why are you much hampered before you understand this message, the true gospel? Because your faith is off. You're already sort of walking in, in an up and down roller coaster type of defeat. But when you hear the truth 
of how the Christian is supposed to live for the Lord by faith in Christ and by what he's done, uh, that is when the enemy will start to oppose you and you will have to fight that good fight of faith. Now going on to Exodus 5-2, reading verse 5-2. Let me turn to the page. It says this, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should, should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Now, Israel... God's chosen people. Egypt represents sin. It's representative of sin and even uh, of the world, uh, of hell. And Pharaoh is representative of the taskmaster, of Satan himself many times. Now listen, I want to read the study note here. I would like to read the study note here um, from the Expositor Study Bible, Exodus 5.2. And this is what the study note says. It says, Satan will not easily... Allow his captives to go free. And God permits the bitter experience of Satan's power in order to exercise and strengthen faith. He allows the enemy to try us, to, to tempt us, to trouble us, to grow our faith. And Macintosh says, when we contemplate Israel amid the brick kilns, of Egypt. We behold a graphic figure of the condition of every child of Adam's fallen race by nature. They were crushed beneath the enemy's galling yoke and having no power to deliver themselves, the mere mention of the word liberty only caused the oppressor to bind his captives with a stronger fetter, and to lay them with a still more grievous burden. Consequently, it was abundantly necessary that deliverance should come from without. That deliverance wouldn't come from man, but deliverance would come from God himself. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Nevertheless, Pharaoh will soon find out, will soon find out exactly who is the Lord. He will soon find out exactly who is the Lord. Going on to verse 3. And they, that's talking about Moses and Aaron, said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray you, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with prejudice or with the sword. Now here's something that we don't we miss much of the time. We miss that Moses and Aaron talking about the sacrifice and, and Pharaoh's response to the sacrifice. We see here, it says, Let it journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. It is the sacrifice of Christ. It's what Christ did at the cross that withholds the judgment of, of God upon man. The only stand the only thing that stands between man and hell is Christ's perfect sacrifice, his atonement and finished work at Calvary's cross. It's the only thing that holds back the judgment of God upon man is what Christ has done at Calvary's cross. On our behalf. He didn't do that on his behalf. He did that on my behalf and your behalf. And praise the Lord, the cross in the middle should have been mine. And that 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 song right there, that touches me every time I think about that. Um, that he took my place. He took every one of our places that have, have that have been born again. Anybody who will believe, he's taken their place on that cross and suffered their punishment on the cross. Hmm. So Pharaoh, look at, so when he they told them about wanting to go and sacrifice unto the Lord, Pharaoh increased the workload. He really, what set him off, what set him off really, it was the sacrifice. 
was the, he didn't know it. But what set him off, what sets the devil off, what sets the demon spirits off, what sets the self-righteous off, is the cross. Is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross. They ended up having to gather their own straw. And they had to keep producing the same amount of bricks. Listen, often, listen, often when one tries to live within the will of God or try to do what God wants them to do, that old devil, he gets mad and he will begin to oppose you. Now we under, that's what often happens when someone first gets saved. And all they know, they get saved, they know it's true, they know they've been born again, they know they're different, all they know is, all they really know is that they was lost and undone and God saved them and they believe in Christ and what Christ has done for them. And they have a joy. I mean, you know, I've heard many preachers, I put it this way myself, and some of you might have put it this way yourself as well. The grass seems greener, the sky is bluer, life is better, there's a peace. And then what happens? The enemy comes in and tries to oppose that and steal that from you. And tries, really what he's trying to do is get you to quit and give up. Now listen, the same thing happens to believers, listen, the same thing happens to believers when, when they, when the Holy Spirit draws them back to the cross of Christ, to putting their faith in Christ and what he's done at Calvary. The same thing happens to the, the enemy will come against them and try to oppose them. Now, we have to keep our faith in God. We have to keep our faith in the Lord and keep believing in Him. Let's read, let's read 5 8. Exodus 5 8. Exodus 5 8 says this. And I'm going to read the study notes with 5 8, and I'm going to read the study notes in 5 9 as well. And the tail, that's the number of bricks which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them, you shall not diminish aught thereof, therefore they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. See, it was the sacrifice that rankled Pharaoh. At the mention of sacrifice, Pharaoh increased the pressure and the workload almost to a killing pace. When the believer first begins to hear the message of the cross, now we're talking about the believer, the one that's been a Christian for a while. He will find the opposition of Satan greatly increasing. This will be confusing at first, but the believer should take heart. The enemy does this because he knows the believer has now found the source of victory. Therefore, he seeks to move the believer's faith from the cross to other things by discouragement and any other means that he can get you to move your faith into something. Verse 9. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. Now listen. Pharaoh regarded the offering of sacrifice, sacrifices as vain words. Now regrettably, most of, our, of the modern church does the same as it regards the cross. They think the, re, the the cross, the preaching of the cross, and the gospel is vain words. And I hate to say it, but that really is the case in most of our uh, Pentecostal circles today. They think it's about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that's greatly important, and we need that. Don't get me wrong, but they put their faith in that. They put their faith in speaking in tongues. They put their faith in miracles. Our faith rests only in Christ and what he's done at Calvary. Let's go to 5, 12, and 13. 5, 12 reads as such. So the people were scattered abroad throughout the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. I'm going to read the study notes here. It is good for a man to learn painfully the nature of sin's dominion and his absolute helplessness in the grip of that monarch. The only way that we can escape the rule and reign 
of the sin nature is through Christ. He's the only one that can set us free. He is the chain breaker. The Lord alone is the chain breaker. Verse 13. And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. So the first move of Israel towards deliverance, the first move of Israel towards deliverance to be set free from Egypt and Pharaoh, <coughs> plunged her into deeper misery so that the people would have preferred being left quiet in their slavery. That's what we're going to see. Their first step towards freedom caused more problems, and then they, was wish, 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 they were wishing that they were still in, in slavery. This is oftentimes a spiritual experience of awakened sinners or even awakened Christians to the message of the cross, to the gospel. They, they feel like they were better off when they were ignorant. And I can say this, and I, I'm not trying to be funny about this. There was a time as a Christian when I felt I was better off in ignorance not knowing certain things than I was knowing the Word of God. Now, how stupid is that? But I can remember thinking that at one time. I'm better off not knowing something because maybe then I'm not accountable. I'm accountable for what I know about Lord. That was my dumb thinking. Now, that comes from the enemy. 14 and 15. Exodus 5, 14 and 15 reads like this. And the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters, had set over them. So the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, Wherefore have you fulfilled not fulfilled your task in making brick, both yesterday and today, as heretofore? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal thus? With your servants. So these leaders, these were the leaders of Israel at this time, that even though they were handpicked by Pharaoh, they weren't picked by the people, um, instead of crying out to the Lord, they cry out to Pharaoh for help. Satan was trying to keep them in bondage by coming against them, by opposing them, by getting them to quit and give up. And to not believe. And like I said, the leaders, they cried unto Pharaoh instead of the Lord. I mean, too often, listen, too often, we do the same thing. We as believers do the same thing. We seek the help and the relief from man instead of help and relief from God. And even worse yet, we seek help and relief from religious man, self-righteous man, instead of God. Listen, we need to be trusted in the Lord, period, folks. Yes, he, we do ask people for help here and there. And, and we need assistance. But we pray to the Lord. And he works behind the scenes in the spiritual realm making things happen. But we don't, we trust in him. We don't trust in another man. Verses 16 and 17. There is no straw given unto your servants. And they say to us, make brick. And behold, your servants are beaten. But the fault is your own people. But he, as talking about Pharaoh, said, you are idle. You are idle. Therefore you say, let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Again, we see it's the sacrifice, it's the cross, it's the Lamb of God that rankled Pharaoh. That sacrifice rankled Pharaoh, and that cross rankled Satan. That sacrifice, the sacrifice was representative of the cross, and, and Pharaoh is representative of the devil. The natural man desires to trust in 
in the arm, the strength, the power and wisdom of man. To lean upon man. Rather than to be supported and uplifted by the invisible yet almighty God. That is what natural man is desired. But we, if we have a relationship with Christ, if we get to know him, there is a desire to quit trusting in man, to quit trusting in self, and rely more upon the Lord, and more upon the leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, verse 18. Go therefore now and work, for there shall not no straw be given you, yet shall you deliver the tale, the number of bricks. The study note here reads, We should learn that it's not natural for us to make plans and then ask God to bless those plans. If God makes the plans, they are assured a blessing. So leave Pharaoh alone and and depend exclusively on the Lord for all that is to be done. Depend upon the Lord. Quit depending upon man. Quit depending on man. And I want to say this. Don't even depend on religious man. Depend on the Lord. You know, many times for the believer today, the taskmaster, the taskmasters that add heavy burdens will be fellow believers or ministers. It's religi religiosity. It's religion. It's ritual. It's false doctrine. It's works. We put your faith in what you do or add, you know, put your faith in that or add that to your faith in Christ, or put your faith in what you do, and in yourself, and in your church, and your religion, and your pastor, and move it away from Christ, and what Christ has done. They are taskmasters. Just like these Egyptian taskmasters. They come from within, yet deep down, and really within, they're Egyptians. They're lost. They're, they're under law, not under grace. I want to read some of the commentary to you out of the, out of the Exodus commentary for this verse. And it reads like this. And this is under the, the heading total commitment. When one accepts the message of the cross, one soon begins to find that this involves Every aspect of his faith and believing, every aspect of his faith and believing, he will find much to his dismay that most of the church world is operating in another direction. In other words, what is being done is not scriptural. The word of faith movement is not scriptural. Most of what's happening in most of our churches today is not scriptural. Consequently, <clears throat> that person might even have to leave his church because they are not preaching the cross. As well, family and friends may have to be laid aside simply because this message pertains itself to a complete lifestyle. Everything comes under the scrutiny of the cross. And as a result, many feel that it's too difficult, too hard. It's not too difficult or too hard because then we, we're, we're more in the presence of the Lord. We have a relationship with Him. And the Holy Spirit is doing things and drawing us and changing us and empowering us and making things happen that we can't happen. Now, continuing on. Further down under the heading, the sacrifice of the Lord, I want to read a couple more paragraphs from the commentary. Our dependence, our trust, our faith must always and without exception be in the Lord. We must take everything to the Lord in prayer, realizing that He alone can bring about what is needed. 
He has the power to do so. And he is willing and able to do so. So why is it that we go to Pharaoh instead of the Lord? The greatest problem, more than likely, is unbelief. In fact, most modern Christians have very little relationship with the Lord. Now listen to that. That's sad, but it's true. As such, there is very little faith and confidence in him. Again, that's sad, but that is true. And as well, I firmly believe that the major reason for this is a lack of understanding of the cross of Christ. Not understanding the finished work. One really doesn't understand Christ. As a result, faith is placed elsewhere. And I might quickly add, gets the same results as the children of Israel did with Pharaoh. When you run to Pharaoh or you run to whoever else to, for your help, you're going to get the same results that Israel did because they didn't run to God. This is not meant to say that we are to eliminate all human contact. That's not the idea. In fact, we have to work with individuals and at times ask help from individuals. However, everything must be soaked in prayer, knowing that God is able to maneuver the situation to where we will receive the help we need, however it comes. In denominations, the truth is, these organizations are at least as political and perhaps even more political than politics. And trust me, it is. It's the old. I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine syndrome. It's people pulling wires, manipulating other people, all to try to get them to do what one wants done. Once you're out of such and you look back at the situation, it becomes sickening. It portrays people who claim the Lord, but in reality have precious little confidence in the Lord, if any at all. They are trusting in themselves or other men. And while they claim trust in the Lord, their actions prove otherwise. We should learn that it's not scriptural for us to make plans and then ask God to bless those plans. If God makes the plans, they are assured of blessing. So leave Pharaoh alone and de depend exclusively on the Lord. For all that is done. Praise the Lord. So depend exclusively on the Lord. For all that is done. Now read Exodus 5, 19-23. This is the close of chapter 5. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. After it was said... You shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. That's reduce the count. And, and they met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. This is Moses' people. This is God's people. Now they're going to go to Moses and Aaron after they already went to Pharaoh. And they didn't go to the Lord. They hadn't gone to the Lord. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because you have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore? Have you so evil entreated this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Now listen. Moses' words might not have been a full of faith. But he sincerely went to the Lord, and the Lord will respect that. The Lord didn't rebuke him, and he did the right thing. He went to the Lord first. He didn't run and try to talk it over with the people of Israel. He didn't go back and, and, and try to get help from Pharaoh. And like I said, even though Moses might have been struggling with his faith here, he went to the Lord. 
He took the issue to the Lord. Then what, what happened after that? Well, God makes a covenant with Moses and with Israel. And I want to read that covenant to you. I got eight more verses I want to read to you. And this is what, if you trust in the Lord and you believe in the world, even if you're struggling with your faith and you go to Him, this is the God that we serve. Listen to this. This is from Exodus 6, verses 1 through 8. Then the Lord said unto Moses, after Moses went to him in prayer and was open with him and didn't hide nothing and was honest with him and transparent with God. Now shall you see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he, that's the Lord, let them go. And with a strong hand shall he, that's talking about the Lord, drive them out of his land, out of Pharaoh's land. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, his children, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, keep in slavery, keep, keep in chains. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will dream, I will, excuse me, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. This is his God. This is the promise of our God. This is our God. The same God. Moses' God. Israel's God. And we will cry out to Him. He will deliver us and set us free. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God. And you shall know I am the Lord your God. Which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I bring you out from under the verdant burdens of Satan and demonic powers. And I will bring you into the land concerning that which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. We will, he's going to bring us into the promised land someday. Oh, that new Jerusalem, that he'll bring us into heaven. That we're, hey, when we leave, when we leave the enslavement of Satan, we're stepping into the promised land. We're getting the first fruits of the promised land that will yet be realized when we are finally glorified, given those glorified bodies. He will deliver us. He will protect us. He will set us free. He will provide for us. He will be our strong watchtower. If we can believe in Him, He can do whatever needs to be done. If we can believe in the Almighty God, if we can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He can do what needs to be done, whatever it is that needs to be done, and we don't have to rely on man. Glory to God. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Trust if we can believe in Him. He can do what needs to be done. But it has to be for His glory, not our glory. Thank you. God bless you. I love you. But more importantly, remember God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit love you. Amen. Be blessed tonight.